Thank you so much for having me. I'm Sarah Greenfield. I am a, a policy analyst and lobbyist with O'Connell Consulting, which is a, a small firm that works mostly with nonprofits and grassroots organizations uh, to have a stronger voice in shaping the policies that affect them. And I've been, I come from a background in organizing um, and have been uh, focused particularly on healthcare policy and advocacy uh, since around 2008. Um, which tends to focus in the, a lot of the consumer advocacy space around access and affordability. And that is very closely tied to the issues that we have a, a great panel here to discuss today, but not always in a way that's clear. So I'm really excited to um, hear from all of you about, uh, about how consolidation is impacting and, and concentration is impacting um, our healthcare system and decreasing human interaction in ways that are really critical to uh, care and, and affordability and, um, and access. Um, this is resulting in a failing system that harms patients and workers, and we'll hear about both, and um, as well as how marginalized groups are left out, uh, leading to racial and geographic disparities in care. So I will um, just give a, the name and uh, organization, brief intro of our folks as we go. I wanna get right into the discussion and you'll learn more about them um, through our conversation today. And also I think the QR code on your um, uh, uh, agendas will lead to their full bios if you're interested. So uh, we have John Farina, the Associate Director of Advocacy for the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Tracy Jones is the Executive Director of the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland and National Director of Mobilization Campaigns for the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Rose Roach is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Nurses Association. Jessica Astrup Eret is a third generation owner of Minnesota based independent pharmacy Astrup Companies. How did I do on your last name? It's Astrup. Astrup. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica Astrup Eret. And Steve Simonson serves as treasurer and managing partner of five community pharmacies in Minnesota. So, welcome to all of you, and thanks again for being here. Um, we're going to kick off our discussion with uh, John. We're intentionally starting with him to ground the discussion in the patient experience. Um, thank you for your courage in speaking today and about your experience as someone both living with HIV and sharing your unique perspective on this work. Um, my question to you and a number of the questions that are going to come up today in conversation, I think, are going to mention um, PBMs, uh, Pharmacy Benefit Managers. So I'm going to model what I'll ask of all of you as we go through, if we do our best to hear the acronyms that we're always throwing out and spell them out. So Pharmacy Benefit Managers are uh, a kind of middleman that, um, as many middlemen do, came up with the promise of uh, saving costs and has grown to have a sort of scary amount of control. So I'm, I'm hoping um, you could tell us how your care and the care of uh, people with HIV generally is impacted by consolidation in the healthcare system and including consolidation in pharmacies, um, PBMs, and, and their anti-competitive practices. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having, uh, for having me today. Um, yeah, so HIV care is very largely dependent upon trust. And so a person who has HIV uh, needs to know that they can trust all the people in their network of care. Uh, so their case manager, their doctor, uh, the other people that they work with, with uh, benefits and things like that, and also their pharmacist. Their pharmacist is a really important part of that because that person uh, knows their situation and knows the medications they need to take uh, and knows how to talk to them about the side effects and things, and it's a person they can trust to talk to. So at our pharmacies, at AIDS Healthcare Foundation, our pharmacists know our clients. Uh, much like many of the independent pharmacies that are, well, you'll hear from later, family-owned places that live in their communities, that interact with their communities, they know the people that they're working with. That, that, that relationship is really important. So if you break that relationship and take away that part, you end up with a person who may uh, fall out of care. You end up with a person who no longer feels the same trust in the system or in what they're doing. So you end up with someone who may not take their meds or may not get their meds. You know, um, mail order is a good example. A lot of these companies are forcing people into mail order pharmacy. Um, for me, myself personally, uh, you know, if a package comes to my house, my husband opens it, he knows I have HIV, no big deal. But if I am someone who lives in a house with say three or four roommates, uh, I'm dependent on those people from the roof over my head, and the package comes in, one of them gets nosy and opens it and says, oh man, John has HIV, ooh, he has AIDS. Mm -hmm. We can't have him live here, and boom, we get kicked out. Mm -hmm. That starts a cycle of not only taking a person off their meds, but it affects potentially their addiction issues, 
or their housing issues, uh, all their healthcare issues, both mentally and physically. So you can't really force somebody into that, into that package because it's not so easy as to say, oh, well, you can just get it in the mail. Um, the other thing is like, you know, if you have a concern or a question about, um, you know, about the drugs you're taking, I can go to my pharmacist at AHF and say, hi, Tara, can you tell me about this? Or can you tell me I'm getting a side effect here? Or this is happening. You know, with big CVS or some of these other companies, you have to pick up the phone and call an 800 number and get put on hold. And maybe I'll get somebody who knows what they're talking about. Maybe I won't. I might get transferred to somebody else. I may never actually get to somebody. I may never actually get through a human being. You know, press one for this, press two for that, press three for that. You know, for a lot of people, that's complicated. That's not easy to deal with. Um, so that becomes a problem. Again, it's not, it, it breaks the level of trust. It interrupts the level of care. And, you know, to go to the pharmacy itself, those pharmacists are forced to push out X number of prescriptions an hour. They're just really just sitting there. There's their machines moving these things. They don't have time to talk to their patients. They don't have time to really interact with them. So this whole system, these PBMs are kind of forcing on, on, on our communities is really detrimental to people overall, but especially someone living with HIV where you have already stigma, you have already a whole layer of other things, and now you have to deal with, how do I deal with my medications? Where do I get these things from? And then finally, I think, you know, um, these big box companies are coming into communities, and I can speak to the experience, you know, in Cleveland. I live in a largely African-American neighborhood. Um, pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid and these big companies have come in and they open up these big box stores, maybe, you know, two or three, you know, there's two on a corner or one down the block from another. They open them up, they buy up all the small independent uh, pharmacies prescriptions and then, you know, about two or three years later, they close. Mm -hmm. And now the people, again, are forced to either rely on going to mail order or going to these tiny little, you know, drive through pharmacies, but they don't have a car. So, they don't like it. so it becomes, again, another layer of problems for people to access their medications. And that's really the bottom line is, you know, the, the way I stay healthy is I have my pills. I take them every day. And that's how come I'm, my HIV load is undetectable. That's, that's how come I'm healthy. Um, I'm fortunate that I have, you know, privilege and insurance and things like that. But a lot of our clients don't have that. And so this really is a burden on a lot of those folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, living as uh, I do, many of uh, folks do here around uh, near where George Floyd was murdered when the um, many of the pharmacies in that area were uh, suddenly closed for sort of an indefinite amount of time. It was really a wake up call to, I mean, there were many Im important wake up calls through that moment, but I think that level of the healthcare access and um, realizing the sort of power that these companies had to decide whether to come back, when to come back, mm -hmm. um, and how difficult it was for people to access their meds was really uh, noticeable. So thank you. Um, we're going to go next to you, Tracy. Uh, Tracy Jones with the um, AIDS Healthcare Foundation as the executive director of a case management organization. Could you tell us about how healthcare consolidations, again, including PBMs, are hurting your clients' access to services? Absolutely, and first of all, thank you for having us, and um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, because I, I, I operate from two particular hats, one as a, uh, a provider of services that has a pharmacy in the clinic, but also as the executive director that has day-to-day -day interaction with people living with HIV and AIDS, it's very clear how both, pe both of these pieces interact. Um, from the, the side of the provider of the small community-based uh, pharmacy, w one of the, the struggles we have is in Cleveland, you know, in the state of Ohio, we're down to one PBM. Um, some places, there are two or three, and these things operate, you know, along with, and it, it was, uh, Mr. Bedoy said earlier, as vertical monopolies in lots of cases. Um, so we even find situations where you, you figure out a system, all they do is figure out how to kick you out of that new system, um, and what, where that gets evidenced is um, we're a specialty pharmacy that which should allow us to provide medications um, such as those that provide care to people that are living with hepatitis. Well, the PBMs will say, yeah, but you can't provide that drug. So <laughs> even in those instances where you do everything you can to get those specialized necess necessities so you can provide the care that's needed, these big box or these PBMs um, will cut you out of that. 
Um, for our pharmacies, our, re our reimbursements are very low. You know, it's kind of like um, that was said on the first panel, you gotta take it or leave it. Whatever they give you is what you gotta take. And then the clawbacks, so basically they give you up front, we decide this is how much we're gonna establish, we're gonna, we're operating with, this is how much we're gonna get. And then the penalties come in, and while it's a sole source drug that you have to use, they try to force you in to using um, generics. And for some of these drugs, the generics just aren't very, very good. In the case of one of the medications for HIV, it was detrimental to the bones and the liver and the creatine of our patients. And mm. so we don't want to use that drug, but that's the drug that a lot of times we get forced into. So from that perspective, you're dealing with a real human. So we say, you know, well, you know, here's what you need to do because we'll find that patients just get kicked off their insurance plans. And you're like, okay, so you need to call and you know, we're gonna walk you through with a case manager to make sure that we get you on another plan. Well, you can't even grieve it. When you sign up for that plan at the beginning of the year, you sign away your rights. So you can't even say, I don't want that insurance company anymore. Well, in some instances, if you can, and you do have a grievance process, you stay on the phone and they switch you around, like John was saying, from place to place to place, to the patient just gives up. So they're stuck in a crappy insurance plan that only will pay for certain amounts of their care or potentially puts them at harm because that information is getting sent to their home or to their employer. So having these single source kinds of insurance companies or these middlemen that are making decisions for people's lives is very, very dangerous. Um, and I think the final thing that I would say is like in Cleveland, we actually do live in a pharmacy desert where my agency is located, the next available, available pharmacy is probably about 28 streets away in any direction. So that's not really, really good for people that live in that community that don't wanna get their prescriptions by mail. I wanna walk in, I wanna to talk to somebody, I wanna have an interaction. A lot of our patients are starting to age. They're not used to mail order. That doesn't feel comfortable. What if it doesn't arrive? Our mail order kind of sucks if we're using, you know, if you're not using FedEx or one of the, the big box delivery systems. So it is not one size fit all. Um, we have to make sure that we're allowing patients to have space and the ability to have an involvement in their health care. And so with that, I'll yield. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we're, we're going to talk more about pharmacy and I think come back to some questions around that. But uh, our next uh, guest, our next panelist, Rose Roach, is the executive director of the Minnesota Nurses Association, um, has uh, been a bit busy um, the past <laughs> few weeks and we're grateful that she could be here um, and, and hoping, Rose, that you can speak to the impact on both patient care and nursing from the consolidation and the merger mania taking place right now within hospitals and how it relates to the 15,000 member uh, strike uh, that uh, is not on right now, but your negotiations are ongoing um, around Minnesota right now. Sure, th uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, greetings of health and solidarity from your nurses. I am not a nurse, I'm a 30 year uh, trade unionist, so I, I was tr that disclaimer. So when looking at the impact that hospital, um, private clinic, and health insurance consolidation has had on cost, quality, and access to health care, there is only one conclusion that can be reached, it's failed miserably. And why is that? I wanna start from the beginning. Why does health care cost so much? Many health economists have held for decades that excessive health care costs in the U.S. are due to two things, physician greed and patients getting too much care. We overuse mm -hmm. health care. In other words, paying for health care using a fee-for-service model incentivizes volume. Therefore, providers provide, uh, prescribe unnecessary care to make more money. That's insulting, and it's not evidence-based. Um, that unsubstantiated theory's solution to bringing down costs is to squeeze physicians and squeeze patients. You squeeze physicians by shifting insurance risk to doctors and hospitals, holding doctors accountable for the cost of care, giving them capitated payments for a certain population of patients by creating you know, HMOs and ACOs and PPOs and EIEIOs, as I say, uh, direct contracting entities, all of which use capitated payments and limited networks. Then you squeeze the patient and make them stop getting so much health care. You increase deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, you underinsure them, you make them choose between a 
whole pill or a half pill, three meals a day or two. And this is how the U.S. uses market forces to control prices in health care, using perverse financial incentives to somehow improve care quality. The problem is health care doesn't operate under general economic market forces. I don't decide to have a heart attack one day because Alina has a discount on bypass surgery. Um, we don't shop for health. We're, when we're sick or injured, we need care. We look to pair health care providers to diagnose and treat us, and we trust their professional judgment. Health is a public good, not a consumable good. And until we're willing to commit to a health care system, not a health care marketplace that puts patients before profits, this convoluted, fragmented, and dangerous system will continue to add costs as cottage industries around electronic medical records, PBMs, and third-party administrators suck up more and more of the precious health care dollars that aren't going directly to care. On the issue of overusing health care, it's based on how we pay for it, supposedly. Research document, it, it doesn't document that this claim is actually real. It's very difficult to find uh, uh, evidence of overuse. The reality is we're paying the wrong fees for the wrong services. For example, we pay more for knee replacement surgery, very lucrative for hospitals, than we do for mental health services. But Excuse me. In that, um, in that way, we do have to reevaluate how we pay for health care, but not because it's the reason for the high cost overall. It isn't, but because we need to bring parity to our care delivery system. But how do we do that when we have no consistent payment system? Um, underuse is, use is far more prevalent and costly to our system than is overuse by a factor of four to one. People choose not to access care, mostly because of costs. This false belief of what's driving health care costs, plus the treatment of health as a commodity, is the genesis for consolidation consolidation and mergers that are taking place within our healthcare system. This business model using HMOs and ACOs as cost containment tactics have driven up prices in two ways. Administrative costs have soared for both insurance and provider sectors, and mergers and consolidations have increased exponentially. As stated in the impact of hospital consolidation by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, quote, hospital consolidation generally results in higher prices. When hospitals merge in already concentrated markets, the price increase can be dramatic, often exceeding 20%. What that looks like here in Minnesota is that we're down to basically eight major hospital corporations, Essentia, Mayo, Sanford, Centricare, M Health, Fairview, Alina, Health Partners, and Hennepin County Medical Center. Consolidation and media fr merger frenzy, excuse me, has been a direct result of managed care and it is not bringing down uh, healthcare costs. But one thing it is doing is it's causing significant stress to our direct care providers. Our care providers are experiencing moral injury. Moral injury occurs when clinicians are repeatedly expected in the course of providing care to make choices that transgress their long-standing, deeply held commitment to healing. And moral injury has a direct correlation to the current health care staffing crisis. And the staffing crisis is a public health crisis. Health care employers claim that it's due to the nursing shortage. That claim is unfounded. There is a record high of 120,000 nurses that are currently registered here in Minnesota. The only shortage is a shortage of nurses who are willing to risk their nursing license and the safety of their patients by working under unsafe conditions that the hospital industry has created. It's this overall exploitation and lack of value and respect for nurses and all of those who work in the care economy that brought 15,000 nurses of MA to the difficult decision to go on strike for three days last week, not only for a fair contract, but for the safety of their patients. Nurses did not take that decision lightly. They wanted to be at the bedside, but the worsening current crisis of care and retention in our hospitals and these corporate health care employers refusal to address these issues has left them no choice. The crushing conditions created by executives in our hospitals, including the deliberate understaffing of nurses and other health care workers, pushing them to do more with less, are driving a crisis of retention, pushing nurses away. A recent survey found that 67 percent of nurses were considering leaving the bedside in the next few years. What will we do without nurses? The crisis of retention and short staffing is also a crisis of care. A recent Minnesota Department of Health report showed an increase in adverse events for Minnesota patients as a result of the overwork and understaffing of nurses um, by hospital executives. As hospitals consolidate and merge, a trend that they are adopting to keep labor costs down is known as the lean model. Lean as in a way to do more and more with less and less. Less human effort, less equipment, less time, and less space. It's about minimizing costs to maximize profit. 
A truly disturbing example of how the lean model worked during the height of the pandemic was nurses being told there is a shortage of N95 respirator masks. To protect themselves and their families and communities, nurses procured their masks, only, their own masks, only to be threatened with disciplinary ash, ac actions, have masks ripped off their face, and be ridiculed for using masks that they brought from home. The lack of PPE inventory was a direct result of this lean model. It also caused a drastic shortage of nurses and other frontline healthcare workers while de-skilling the profession of nursing. Another ominous consequence of consolidation mania is the creation of healthcare deserts. We see this happening across the state, particularly in rural communities such as Albert Lee, where Mayo shut down the maternity department, causing women to drive up to 50 miles in labor to safely deliver a baby. And in downtown St. Paul over the past three years, M Health has, uh, after merging with Health East, closed one of two long-term care hospitals in all of Minnesota, Bethesda, resulting in a loss of services for patients with high care needs. And following that up with the closing of St. Joseph's Hospital, the oldest hospital in the state of Minnesota, which provided vital services to a vulnerable com uh, community, depleting access to care for those suffering with mental health and addiction illnesses. But don't worry, M Health is going into partnership with Acadia Healthcare, a for-profit mental health company that has just described the investment uh, environment for a behavioral facility in the U.S. as a large market with attractive trends. Talk about the wrong focus when we are determining services for patients suffering with mental health and addiction illnesses. This is all too common in northern Minnesota as well, but thankfully in one case, m &A nurses in the Duluth area worked with their community to prevent Catholic Health Initiative, a Colorado-based healthcare conglomerate strapped with major debt from merging with Essentia Health. Add to that the move to this high hospital at home model and more artificial intelligence means of providing care and we're now in a world of hurt literally as well as figuratively. It is for these reasons our nurses felt it necessary to go on strike for us their patients. Nurses have given hospital executives every opportunity to fix the problems they created in the hospitals and they must be held accountable and return the hospitals to their mission of patient care. So what are, what's being done about consolidations? Some citizens are taking on hospitals in the courts. Last February, a group of citizens in Connecticut sued uh, Hartford Healthcare. This class action lawsuit argues hospital consolidation has crushed everyone's bank accounts and led to the rise of anti-competitive contracts that force insurers and employers to accept a take it or leave it terms. We have to make sure that federal and state authorities have what they need to stop hospital mergers if it's not in the best interest of the community and the patients. At the state level, Attorney General Ellison and his office have shown they're willing to stand up for consumers against big corporations. We need to ensure his office also has whatever tools he needs to take care of the health care facilities in our community. Consolidation mergers, value-based pavements, all failed market-based fixes that we keep trying over and over again. Why? Well, as Willie Hutt oh, Sutton once said when he was asked, why do you rob banks? He said it's because it's where the money is. I fear that's the same reason we now have private equity equity investors, billionaire businessmen, and Wall Street managers focused on the healthcare industry. It's where the money is. But nurses know that profiting from another human being suffering is immoral and unconscionable. We're in a crisis now. We can't stop. We can't continue this tinkering. We must guarantee truly affordable health care for all, no exceptions, which is why the nurses are fighting here in Minnesota to pass and implement the Minnesota Health Plan and nationally for an improved and expanded Medicare for All system, because as David Lloyd George once said, you can't cross a chasm. In small steps. I want to end my remarks by reading to you a, blog, a short blog from a uh, nurse, Emily Perscala, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Emily wrote, if I die, I don't want to be remembered as a hero. I want my death to make you angry too. I want you to politicize my death. I want you to use it as fuel to demand change in this industry, to demand protection, living wages, and safe working conditions for nurses and all workers. Use my death to mobilize others. Use my name at the bargaining table. Use my name to shame those who have profited or failed to act, leaving us to clean up this mess. Don't say heaven has gained an angel. Mm. Tell them negligence and greed has murdered a person for choosing a career dedicated to compassion and service. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, and, and thank you, uh, the nurses, for your leadership in confronting this, and I, I think uh, each of you have said in one way, and you've really crystallized that this link between profit 
the profit motive and the drive for consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, Jess, could you tell us more about your pharmacy and what it means when um, PBMs offer these uh, take it or leave it contracts and, and maybe just a little more about how the PBM really works in your world? Sure, absolutely. That was a tough act to follow. <laughs> I, feel like I have to define my energy now. Um, so take it or leave it contracts are kind of a buzzword that we hear all the time in healthcare, especially in pharmacy. They are exactly like they sound. They come across a fax machine, since we still rely on those heavily in healthcare. Most people don't. Um, comes across 14 to 35 pages. Somewhere in there it says you have anywhere between 7, 30 days to um, deny this contract in writing, and you are forced to make a quick decision that impacts a lot of people. So I wanted to give a specific example, so I wrote down some notes because we've had a few of these recently. Steve and I talk about them all the time, but we just had a situation December of last year, so December 22nd, right during the heat of the holidays, end of the year, insurance changes, uh, fax came across our specialty pharmacy's desk um, that said we had... It was on December 22nd. We had until January 31st to respond in writing if we wanted to turn down this contract from one of the big three pharmacy benefit managers. So essentially, they came to us saying, if you don't decline, these rates will go into effect starting on March 28th, 2022. So call it three months, um, and we had to make this decision. So in the case of this single contract, it was 35 to 40% of our overall volume. So we have a pharmacy that serves patients who are often on medications that require a higher touch, that require prior authorization, that are not always brand name, but often brand name. So we're doing a lot of extra work to get the patient taken care of just to be handed a contract that says, you're gonna see 5% come off, off of your profit in three months. At the same time, we're left with this decision of these patients have relied on us for a maintenance medication every 28 or 30 days, and now the patient's going to be disrupted in their care. One of the main medications that we fill out of our specialty pharmacy that was going to be impacted by this significantly is a migraine maintenance medication, the only medication in its class. There is no generic alternative. People have failed the, the old medications that are out there, the old faithfuls, they've already failed those. So this is kind of a last ditch effort to get migraines under control. And many of you probably know, have it, being a migraine sufferer is extremely disruptive to your daily life. You can't work, you can't care for kids, you can't care for your parents, you can't often even get out of bed if you're a person who suffers from migraines day in and day out. So we have all of these patients, 40% of our entire population, who could be disrupted because of this PBM choice. So PBM sends us a 14 page document, in there, it says, because of our responsibility to plan sponsors, so employers, mm -hmm. we have to decrease your reimbursement. It's costing the plan too much. So as a self-funded employer ourselves, we have yet to see our costs go down ever in the last decade. <laughs> so I don't know where the savings are coming from um, that they're taking in these contracts. So they take 5% off the bottom line. Our profit goes down to less than $10 on each one of these prescriptions. Mind you, they're expensive prescriptions, and our profitability is just cut to single digits. We often have to mail these out. We have to do prior authorizations. There are pharmacists involved in every step of this process, but we care about patient care, so we accept the contract, despite us nearly taking a loss. By the time we ship the medications, we are taking a loss. So that's one example. Um, another example that happened in July of last year was another big three PBM sent across a fax to each of our individual locations. So we have 13 community pharmacies in small towns. We have pharmacists who work there. We have many technicians, and faxes come like hotcakes in the morning. You just have tons and tons of faxes. If you're not sifting through and finding this paper, you will miss it. And again, if you don't deny in writing this contract, you are stuck with the terms of it. So this one, Steve and I talked in detail about with other other pharmacy owners, which we're not really supposed to. You're not supposed to collude with your peers, but we're all trying to navigate this world of contracts that truly are a loss without any expenses. So the pricing that they gave us, we couldn't even walk in and unlock the door. Like there was no payroll could have been, um, could have been used to fill these prescriptions. So we declined the contract. This was a contract for 2024. We don't even know the implication of that. We don't know even what members, what customers, what patients will be impacted by that, what employers. But we had to make a decision. And in pharmacy for too long, we accepted every contract. Now we can't. We, we know that this would have been a suicidal move to our business. So we turned down a contract. But like I said, 
it negatively impacts us, but we have some time to plan for that. We can make some moves. The people who it really negatively impacts is our community members who end up on that plan. For example, we have the only pharmacy in Houston County. So in Minnesota, there's an entire rural community, largely farming, small manufacturing. And if and when we go away, because we can't at least break even in these towns, no one else is coming in there. Your only option becomes mail order. And I've been joking with these guys today, but I've been trying to track down a beta blocker medication for a dog all morning that I had to send in the mail because the patient was out of town. And we can't rely right now on the logistics of postal service to get things done in a timely fashion. People need human interaction to know that that circle is closed in healthcare. So take it or leave it contracts are forcing us to make decisions that either we can't serve our community members or we can't turn our lights on and there's no negotiation. We don't get to go back to the table and say, well, if you could just give us, instead of a 5% cut, we could do a 2.5% cut and we could still make it and, and you could give money back to that employer, you know, who you're really going to pass that savings on to. We don't get that opportunity. And Luke's laughing over here, but it's, <laughs> that's what they tell us in all these letters. It's for the plan sponsors, it's for the employers, but really we can see all of their profitability go up every quarter, record profits in the PBM industry, and those of us with feet on the ground, like you're saying, are the ones that are really struggling. So that's what a take it or leave it contract is. It's exactly what, I didn't even use half my notes, I just get, I was just so energized about you. But the last thing that I wanted to say on it is, in my small communities, some towns have multiple pharmacies, many of them don't, but even in those situations where there are multiple pharmacies, Oftentimes, the patients who end up with us, as some of my favorites, have been fired from every other pharmacy in town. They're too high maintenance, they take up too much of their time, they require mm -hmm. too much communication with their doctor, and every other pharmacy in town says, we don't have time for this, we don't have time for you. And then they'll have a friend or a doctor or someone else say, go to Sterling, go to Goodrich, they'll give you the time. And without us there, some of my most like desperate patients in the hardest times, often low income, often with a language barrier, they don't have a place to go. Mail order is a phone tree. And so we have the people who need us most without an option. And that's just the reality we're living in and it's getting worse week after week, really. It's not even year over year, it's, it's week after week. So that's all I have, thanks. Mm. Thank you. And thanks for continuing to do that work in, in that area. Um, uh, Steve, you're the treasurer managing partner at Goodrich Pharmacy. Could you give us examples of the drugs where you're wildly under reimbursed, uh, one of the side effects of these contracts, and why do you accept those terms sometimes? I'd be happy to, and I'm also going to repeat some of the things the other panelists have Great. said because they're very important. Uh, Goodrich Pharmacy has been in business since 1884. That's 136 years. We've been adaptable, nimble, nimble benable, and uh, very innovative over those years but it's become harder and harder to keep the lights on and make payroll to the unfair trade practices we experience every day. 95% of our business is from insurance covered patients, whether it is the government, their employer, or self-funded, and those insurance companies usually own or contract with pharmacy benefit managers. They are very vertically integrated, meaning they control all, all aspects of patient access to a pharmacy and their services. First, they control entry, meaning they do the contracting for pharmacy services, take it or leave it contracts, like Jess said, a short timeline to sign, no accountable person to talk to in any way, an answering machine that's never answered, and no, no address or name to send in a letter to. They present us terrible contracts at reimbursements below our cost every day, while they make record profits. Number two, there are direct competitors steering patients to their own pharmacies and their mail order systems or who they pay more than they would pay their independent pharmacies or other pharmacies that aren't owned by them. And three, they finally set the, pay they, um, finally they set the payment for those services. Many now own their own insurance companies which contract with them and their own pharmacies and pay themselves more the, for the same medications. Our re reimbursement rates are terrible and have been going down for 20 plus years. And our expenses, as you know, inflation have continued to go up. Reimbursing below cost and medications or break even at best has become the normal. We expect bad contracts to keep our relationships with our patients and serve our communities. We have a professional obligation to be their chosen healthcare provider until they decide to go elsewhere and see someone else. 
Here's an example of higher payments to one of the uh, chain pharmacies. One of our pharmacists was out of town in Wisconsin visiting his parents. His son got sick, went to urgent care. They prescribed an antibiotic. He went into a CVS store and uh, he had to pay him $40 for half the prescription, 20 tablets. So he only took half the prescription. He went back home and filled it at the pharmacy he was responsible and we were only paid $29 for exactly the same manufacturer, medication, same quantity. Uh, there's something wrong in that. that. As far as patient steering, we had a long time patient, over 45 years. She came in crying that she could no longer use our pharmacy. After being forcefully steered to a pharmacy system that owns a major PBM and an insurance company. She sobbed, we're the only good thing in her life since her husband died four years ago. We hear stories like that every day. Weekly we receive letters, phone calls from them asking us to sell our pharmacy business to them. They rarely offer the staff jobs. They close the pharmacies, transfer the records miles away to one of their stores or their mail order business. Access is to the pharmacy and their pharmacist is greatly diminished. Besides PBMs paying some pharmacies more than us for the same exact prescriptions, these pharmacies hide this information by not showing the amount paid on the patient's receipt in many cases to hide their rates against best practice requirements. In the last 90 days, and I ran this report yesterday, we filled 53,000 prescriptions. Above, above those, 4,939, which is 9.3%, were paid below our acquisition cost that we had to pay for the medications, a loss of $68,000. We filled 780 brand prescriptions that have generics and for a very low margin of $1,250, that is an average cost for the uh, brand names of $261 per brand medication, with our average cost for the same generic prescription only being $23. Companies mandate these brands over generics to capture the lucrative manufacturer's rebates and don't rarely pass them along to employers or patients. For most brand name asthma inhalers and insulins, we are frequently re reimbursed over $10 or more below cost at the end of the day and lose money on every one of those prescriptions, but do it because it's the right thing to do. The patients need those medications. We filled over 1,300 prescriptions where total reimbursement, copay, and whatever the PBM payment was less than a dollar. National surveys have shown that a pharmacy's cost to fill a prescription averages $11 at a minimum per prescription. All healthcare is local, and our pharmacists are located where our patients live. We're the ones who gave COVID shots to the homeless shelters, women's shelters, assisted living facilities, and nursing homes. We work very closely with Anoka County and the Minnesota Department of Health to make sure that all facilities, no matter how small or far away, had access to immunizations and pharmacist services. We say in pharmacy, the most expensive drug is the wrong medication, delivered without a pharmacist delivering patient care with no follow-up to see if it is working and not causing any side effects. Our relationships built over years with other healthcare providers greatly benefits patients with better outcomes and lower costs. Something has to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of our panelists for uh, for these opening com opening comments and the, and most of our panel. But we do have about 15 minutes left, I think, for to take some questions um, from the audience. And is somebody gonna grab the mic as well? Um, thank you. And then uh, I can add some too. Did I see somebody tentatively raising a hand over here? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'm Phil Longman with uh, Open Markets. Um, in the television market where I live, I see frequent ads paid for by Big Pharma talking about this evil thing of PBMs and how if you're mad at your price of drugs, you should get mad at PBMs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm naturally suspicious of such a message being paid for by Big Pharma. If you could, uh, anyone who would like to address the relative degree of culpability here between PBMs and pharma to the extent that there's a distinction between the two of them anymore. Thanks. Great question. Anybody chomping at the bit? I can try to tackle that a little bit. It's a complicated situation. We are seeing a trend that kind of moves away from the partnership between 
PBMs and manufacturers, we're seeing more and more drug products come to the market and working directly with a dispensing entity or having their own. So we're seeing more and more manufacturers do like a limited distribution process for their medications. So they come out and they say, we are only going to work with these couple of pharmacies, we're gonna limit the people who ever even touch our medication. Sometimes we can't even get medications directly through our wholesaler. Um, so there is, there's a battle ensuing between the two because it's all about formulary placement. So the brand name medications, they want to have that prime place on a formulary. They wanna be preferred brand so people can have access to it without jumping through all of the hoops. And if they don't find that placement on the formulary, which is dictated by the PBM, then the brand manufacturers get all up in arms because their medication is no longer or is is not going to have the market share um, in the timing that they were expecting. So it's really this these dollars in the background moving, in my opinion, that has to do with with placement on a formulary that's created this battle between the two. So pharmacy benefit managers, I do think, when I talked to previous generations of my family who were in this business, they came out and started doing an okay thing. They really mm -hmm. were created to contain costs and streamline a, a, compl a complex situation, but then saw these opportunities to grab dollars from manufacturers being one of them. But the scary thing about it, which Rose mentioned is, now actually, I think it was even earlier that it was mentioned, is that now we have pharmacy benefit managers telling doctors that what they prescribed is not best for the patient with whom that doctor has a relationship with. So that's kind of terrifying. There are many reasons that a doctor might be choosing a more expensive or a lesser known product for an individual. And I think that the PBMs have inappropriately jumped in between that relationship. And healthcare in general has just devalued the provider. And I include pharmacists as providers when I say provider, um, has just devalued those relationships. So that was a lot of words. I don't know if that answers your question, but there is kind of a, bat a battle ensuing between the two right now. Yeah, it was all fine when they were giving them smaller rebates. That They made their own bed and they started giving PBMs replacement on formularies way back when they first started and they ever increasing rebates. And, and the uh, PBM saw that it was a great resource uh, then they were allowed, there was a federal court case that let them advertise prescriptions, medications, which were the only country in the world that allows that, uh, to advertise prescriptions on, on TV or radios, et cetera. And so like Jess says, they're basically telling the, the patient what's the best drug, who argue with their physicians, yeah. the, you know, the, the control is in the wrong place. But as long as the PBMs have uh, consolidated their monopoly, um, they control so much power and the phar pharmacy pharmaceutical industry is finally chafing at the power that they've given, that's my opinion, that they're kind of, um, we'll see how it changes, but. From our perspective, we see them as a two-headed monster. <laughs> I don't see one is better than the other. <laughs> I only give the one. I mean, I, I really chafe around pharma because we know that those are drug companies that are putting their finger on the scale. Um, from the perspective of the PBMs, well, we just transferred the power over, and now it's a vertical monopoly. So CVS owns the pharmacy, the drug, and the distribution of the drug. So they're both, you know, it's like Godzilla got split in half. Yep. I would just add to you from the um, sort of policy perspective that there's been some progress, modest, on regulating PBMs, um, but that, that comes out of that decision to like, hey, let's point the finger at, at these guys. And it's needed, right? And we need more of it. And yet it is also, that doesn't mean that over here who is pointing the finger is not also driving a significant portion of the costs. Were you about to yeah, jump? I, I was just going to say um, on a little broader level, I mean, it's happening throughout healthcare in general, right? So um, hospital systems are generally self-insured, right, for their employee benefits, okay? So, but then they have third-party administrators, so they might have a Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever, right, come in. And it, it's just the most fascinating thing because one, on the one hand, they say, you know, you're using too much health care, so we have to increase the, uh, you know, the cost of the premiums. And then at the same time, the insurance companies fight with the hospitals about what's the cost and what's the reimbursement rate. I mean, if anybody really knows what it costs, what he anything in health care costs, let me know what that is because I'm telling you, you can't find it out. It's shrouded in secrecy. Um, and it's different if you're with Medica versus Medicare versus, you know, uh, 
um, you're you're on Medicaid, you know, versus Blue Cross Blue Shield, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts, and it's why we have so much waste in cost in the system as well. But for the nurses, I mean, so they say to the nurses, well, we'll get you can um, get this premium cheaper as long as you stay in network, and in network is them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right so not that nurses don't love their hospitals and stuff of course they do they, they work there but maybe they don't want their employer knowing everything about their <laughs> and they'll say oh we don't know that yeah okay mm -hmm. um but uh the thing is is that it's like all right so you figured out how much you're going the price is going to be on the front end with these premiums and then you're figuring out how to reimburse yourself on the back end with what the costs are it's like the company store i mean for those of you who are young might not re remember from labor history days because we don't teach that anymore but um it's it's like, what, what is going on here? This is absolute insanity. There is a price to this. Figure it out, reimburse it appropriately, make sure the people who are actually providing care are, are responsibly and fairly compensated for that and move on. This is health care for God's sakes. Right. Makes me nuts, sorry. And, <laughs> and it, 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 I think it all speaks to the fact that the things that we've heard today, whether it was the grocer or the bookseller earlier, or the farmers, uh, the independent pharmacist, We've, we've lost track of people mm -hmm. and the people that we take care of or that we serve or that are in our communities. We focus now on profit. It's all about profit, profit, profit. Who's making profit? And ironically, they don't want our friends at the end of the table to make any profit. They want all the profits. So it, we've lost track of individuals, of people, and the whole system is broken because now it's all about who can make money and where they make it. And they're all fighting with each other. And like you said, pointing fingers in different directions and who gets lost? It's it's the, the it's person living with HIV in Cleveland. It's the uh, the, the the woman in, in middle, rural Minnesota who needs you know care or whoever it is. It, the people are the ones that get lost because it's all about profit, and we forget that we we, sh we really need to be focused. We go back to who we are and what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. I'm, just to clarify, are we needing to wrap up or we have a little longer? I got my wires crossed. Hmm? Okay. I think, I think we're um, going to hear um, more, a little bit about solutions from our Attorney General in a few moments, but um, so if we have uh, any final comments from anyone here about solutions that you have in mind or have supported, I think we might just have time for that. Um. The only thing that I would say, and this kind of piggybacks on what Rose said earlier too, but if we just focus on the people with feet on the ground actually impacting patient care, I think we'll make the right decisions. If the focus is too much on cost or products or who's at fault or, or, or whatnot, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere. This is really about human beings who need access to care and we can argue preventative or, or, or reactive or whatever, but really if we put the humans first who have been too far out of the equation now, I think we'll make good decisions. Um, that's all I was going to say. Great. That's a great note to end on. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And thanks for joining us.